morning and welcome to Encounter Christian Church. We're glad that you're here today. Let's all stand and sing, There's Sunshine in My Soul. chapter 16, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he said, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But then in verse 15, Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. 
I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. The fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that is the bedrock for our faith. That is the foundation. Jesus is everything to us. He's the whole world. Let's sing, Jesus is all the world to me. with I need thee every hour.
So we're in the second of our series on spiritual encounters of the closest kind. We're looking at another story that takes place in the book of John. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the eighth chapter. We'll get there in a few moments, but we want to take care of a couple things before we get there. Um, so as we begin today, just like we did last week, one of the things I think that's important for us to do is in some of these stories that we've become familiar with, to understand what the true focal point of the story really is, not the one that we many times have grown accustomed to. Like last week, if you remember, we, we looked at this story, and if you go to the headline in your Bible, it's probably going to say something like this. Um, Jesus heals the official son, and that will introduce that story um, that we looked at last week, when really, I think, um, the title for that ought to be um, the father who finds faith, because it wasn't about the healing, remember? It was about the faith. That's what that was all about. That, that miracle was not a miracle done just so that Jesus could show off or he could maybe alleviate someone's pain. It, it was far greater than that. He was attempting to strengthen or to bring about for the very first time someone's faith. So what about the story we're going to look at today? Well, the same thing is going to happen. If, if I were to tell you um, the story we're going to look at is about a woman, and I started with this, these phrases, um, it's the woman caught what? In adultery. We all know that story, right? Uh, that's what our minds go to. But that's going to be inappropriate once again because the story really is not about adultery. It's about forgiveness. That's what the story's about. That's what Jesus is trying to teach us when we go through this story. So again, I think a better title for that would be the woman who receives forgiveness. Not the woman caught in adultery. It's the woman who receives forgiveness. Oh, you're there. You're out there. Awesome. <clears throat> is that because you want me to shut off and quit or? Oh. <laughs> Jesus does not deal with the topic of adultery here. Although the Pharisees wished that he had, obviously, that's what they were trying to somehow bring about. Instead, Jesus focuses on the need for grace and love and mercy and forgiveness. But for those of you who might consider me soft on sin, if I don't say anything today about adultery, I'm again it. The Bible is again it, so is Jesus. That's just to set the record straight. Now, I'm not trying to make light of a very serious subject because I know that is. But this passage is not the one that you and I should go to when talking about the problem of adultery. Jesus is not dealing with sin here. What he's dealing with is the remedy for sin and the problems that surround it. In fact, this passage and everyone involved in it, the issue of the right or wrong of adultery, it isn't even up for question. Nobody questions that it's wrong. Everyone in the story accepted that it was wrong. Jesus did. Obviously, the Pharisees did. Unfortunately, even the woman knows that it's wrong. So if you really want to get a picture, a view in your mind of what Jesus thinks, what God thinks about adultery and divorce, then you should go to the Old Testament and read the book of Hosea. And when you do, you will see that what Jesus is doing here, his actions and his teachings are completely consistent with what God has already taught us about that subject. All right, so let's jump into the story. It's in John 8. 1 through 11, one other housekeeping thing, possibly in your Bible, it might have some notation at the beginning or the end of that story saying something about not sure where this story really comes from or where it should be. L let me sh just make sure you understand something. There's nothing spurious about this event. It's just that some of the scholars are not sure where it should be in the book of John. And this is the point that they think it should be placed, but they're not absolutely sure. But please, don't ever think this didn't actually happen. 
It did. And we have a number of things that we need to learn from it. So let's start with verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. By the way, if you all remember when I first came here and I preached my first sermon, I was seat, sitting in a stool. I said there's a reason for that. There's a, multi, there's a few reasons. This is one of them. I told you, if you go through the Gospels, you're going to see many, many, many times, more than not, when Jesus is teaching, it identifies the fact he's sitting when he teaches. I think there's a lot of reason for that. We don't have time for that today, but here's one of those places. Verse 3, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such woman. Now, what do you say? They were listing or using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then again, he stooped down and he wrote in the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. So here we are. What is Jesus going to do with this woman? How is he going to react? See, the Pharisees are just, they're certain that this time they have painted him into a corner that he cannot get out of. There is no escaping this situation. If Jesus says, kill her, well, he will be true to the law. That is true. But he will definitely embitter the people because they know that this is all a farce. They know there's a double standard with this leadership, and, and they can't stand the double standards that the Pharisees continually live under, as well as the fact that he would at that point go against the Roman law, which forbids Jews to take someone's life for that particular reason. But if he says, let's just let her go, well, then he is going to go against the law of Moses, and he condemns himself as a heretic and a false prophet. So what's he going to do? Well, what he does is he brings the discussion to the issue that needs to be confronted. It's not adultery. It's forgiveness. Let's look today at three attitudes of forgiveness prevailed that day and unfortunately still prevail today. First, the first attitude towards forgiveness is demonstrated by the Pharisees. They won't give it. It's just that simple. They just won't. It doesn't make any difference what it looks like, what it feels like, what you think you should do. They just, they're unwilling to forgive others. The Pharisees, the, the problem here is not that they are unable to dispense forgiveness. They just are simply unwilling they just won't do it. Now, why in the world would the Pharisees, or anyone for that matter, be unwilling to sh share forgiveness with someone? Why would they have such a haughty attitude as they condemn this lady? Well, I think, first of all, it's because they categorize sin. You see, in their mind, this sin is terrible. Their sins, not so much. See, <laughs> this basic concept is true for pretty much all of us. Everyone else's sin is far worse than my sin. Have you not felt yourself in that position at a time in your life? Or you've run into people who obviously feel that way? Why does that happen? Well, I tell you why, because you see, in our minds, there's a lot of things that happen when we are confronting our own sin in our own life. One, 
we, we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. We, we don't immediately jump to the wrong conclusion. We, we, we begin to think about the circumstances that led us to this particular fault. And we understand the background of our lives and, and all the things that went into bringing us to that moment. And, and quite frankly, because we do that, we don't think that we fail like someone else does. We need to listen for just a moment. Just because you and I know our own background, what led us to the moment when we failed? We understand the circumstances that surrounded it. It never eliminates the guilt of our sin. It just doesn't. There's no way to explain away sin. But it does, and this is crucial, especially for today, but it does lay the groundwork for us and others receiving forgiveness. You know, if we categorize sin in our minds, we will never be able to dispense forgiveness into the lives of those around us. In fact, if we get into the habit of diminishing the evil of our sins, it won't be very long before we feel that we are above the law itself. We elevate ourselves above others around us. And forgiveness is something that we just don't think other people deserve. That's exactly what happened here. That, in all probability, was just a Jewish sting operation, folks. I mean, <laughs> this woman was trapped. She was just a pawn. Where's the man? Doesn't it take two to tango? <laughs> so where's he? Why is he not guilty? Why is it just this one? Well, first of all, women weren't as important back then, and, and they weren't really worried about the sin of adultery at this point. See, this isn't about these people, only this one being used as a pawn to put Jesus in a position to where he can't get out of. That's all this is about. The only thing on their mind was trapping Jesus, and this woman then was the pawn to put Jesus in checkmate. There's been a lot of speculation as to what Jesus was writing in the dust of the ground. I'm sure you've heard lots of people talk about it. You know, maybe he was writing scriptures on forgiveness. Maybe he was writing down other sins. Maybe some specific sins that because he was God, he knew was represented in that group today that surrounded that woman. Maybe, <laughs> this is what I like to think, that's because you're so lucky I'm not God. I would have been writing the sin and then the name. <laughs> Rabbi John, Rabbi Jose, Rabbi whatever. That's what I would have been doing. I don't think what Jesus was doing that, but whatever it was, it caused these men to realize this was not a battle that they were gonna win. And so they left. They left reluctantly, unfulfilled, defeated, but still unforgiving. And I contend unforgiven. Now, some of us resemble the Pharisees when it comes to forgiveness. That is not just an attitude that took place when Jesus lived. It isn't just something that took place with a small group of Jewish leaders way back 2,000 years ago. Unfortunately, that concept still exists today. We are judgmental in our approach towards other people and their sins. Do you remember one of the other very short stories that Jesus told? He, he told about two people who went up to pray in the temple, and one was a Pharisee, one was the publican. And, and when he tells the story, he said, you know, the one that should have known, the one that should have been so knowledgeable of the things that were wrong in his life, didn't see a thing wrong in his life. All he could see what was wrong in that guy's life, the publican. The Pharisee became so haughty that he didn't realize the real sin of his life was pride. And Jesus said, when the two went down, only one of those went down forgiven. 
and it wasn't the Pharisee. We must be very careful of the attitude that we carry towards others. One of the last people on earth that I would want to be compared to, that I would want to be grouped with, is a Pharisee. You know, there's lots of people in our world, lots of types of people in our world, that we might not know exactly what Jesus thinks of them, but the Pharisees are not one. (laughs) We know what he thinks of the Pharisees. He told us in graphic detail what was lacking in their life. And because I know what he thinks of them on the day of judgment, that's the last group of people that I would want to be associated with. There's another attitude of forgiveness that was existent that day. The second attitude toward forgiveness is demonstrated by the woman. She doesn't expect it, truly. She has no clue that there is any hope for her that day. Do you you think for even a moment that she expected or felt deserving of forgiveness? Absolutely not. How do you think she felt up until verse eight, which is the moment when the crowd disperses and it's just she and Jesus? I think she felt ashamed. I think she felt embarrassed. I think she felt desperate. I think she felt terrorized. I think she felt hopeless. I mean, can't you identify with her? Have you ever been caught red-handed in sin? The combination of sin and an unforgiving judge will produce those feelings and many, many more. So do you think she expected to be forgiven that day or deserved to be forgiven that day? Absolutely not. The law had stripped her of the right to feel like she could be forgiven. The Pharisees stripped her of the feeling of being worthy of being forgiven. And it just keeps happening, folks. It didn't die that day when that group of men dropped their rocks and walked away. The reason it keeps happening is because we take our cues from men instead of from God way too often. Many of us are sensitive to God's law And because of that, you can feel stripped of the right to be forgiven. I've been there. I know all about that feeling. In fact, I think the more you know about God's law, the more you can feel like you don't have the right to be forgiven. That there's no reason that you should be forgiven. This was the law. This is what I did. It was wrong. Most of us remember times when we have been made to feel unworthy of forgiveness. Some of it came because of those that were around us who possessed a very haughty spirit about it, but the rest of it came from within us. It's inside of us. You know, there's more honest confession that takes place in most bars between the guy at the bar and the bartender than a lot of churches. You know why that is? Because in those places, there's a lack of judgmental attitude. Acceptance is offered because everybody there knows they're in the same position. One of the saddest things I think viewed by God must be those who have accepted his forgiveness who then become the haughty ones and the self-elevated ones that come to the point that they are refusing to pass on that same forgiveness to other people. And in the process, they rob each and every one of us of the feeling of being worthy of being forgiven. Next week, This will probably uh, clean out the audience for next week. I have to preach again. One one of the people I'm gonna talk about, just briefly, is one of my heroes. It's, It's David. The reason he is one of my true favorites is that, um, 
Man, he messed it up. Not just once, but I mean a lot of times. And not just little things. I mean, take all the big sins you want, and most of them, he did. He murdered, he lied, he committed adultery. He was a horrible parent. He went directly against God's directive more than one time. I mean, if there was anybody that ought to be completely and utterly unworthy of forgiveness, you would think David ought to fall in that category. But this is what I love about what we hear and find out through the life of David. There was one man, one man in all of God's word who gets this title, a man after God's own heart. What is that? How does does that happen? How is Jesus willing to sit on the throne of David? David, the adulterer, the murderer? Really? Yes. And you know why it is? Because as you go through the scripture, you're gonna find nobody who has this ability more than David. He knew how much God loved him. And when God said, I forgive you, he believed it wholeheartedly. He didn't doubt it for a moment. And that's why he's a man after God's own heart. You and I need to come to the point that no matter who we are surrounded by, no matter how haughty they might be, no matter how much control they feel like they might have over you, you need to recognize something. God says, Jesus says, you are worthy of being forgiven. Not because you're worthy, not because I'm worthy, but because he loves us that much. Don't get trapped. Don't don't walk away from the greatest gift ever offered to you. Now there was a third attitude that day. Luckily, I skipped over a scripture, don't worry about it. The Lord sometimes um, straightens me out when I preach. I think I know what I should say, and he said, no, that's not right. Here's the third attitude. The last attitude towards forgiveness is demonstrated by Jesus. He freely bestows it. Amen? Amen. See, this is the most shocking when you consider that Jesus is the one most offended and hurt by this woman's sin. It wasn't the Pharisees, it wasn't even the woman herself. It was Jesus who was hurt more than anyone else that was there that day in that crowd. It was his love that had been rejected. It was his commands that had been spurned. It was his cross that was going to get heavier with that sin that he was gonna have to carry. Listen very carefully. If Jesus is the only one who truly has a right to be offended by our sins, and he is. Trust me, I don't care what anybody else says, they have no right to be offended by your sin. Jesus does. And after he has seen his love rejected by you and I, when his commands have been spurned by us, when we have laden him with yet another sin to have to pay for, he can still forgive us? Then how in the world can I come to the conclusion that I can't forgive someone else of their sins against me? Truly, how is that possible? Please notice how heavenly forgiveness is bestowed. With Jesus, forgiveness comes with an acceptance of who you are, with the admonition to move on from there to something far greater. 
Did Jesus overlook the, the sin of this woman? Did he, did he just say to her, oh, it's no big deal, don't worry about it, everybody does that. <laughs> That's not what he said. That's not how he reacted to it. He didn't tell her it was no big deal. He didn't tell her it was okay. He didn't say, you know what? Maybe I made a mistake when I said that wasn't a good thing to do. No, he didn't overlook her sin. He did acknowledge that it was wrong. But what he said was, now leave your life of sin and move on. There's no condoning of the sin, and yet there is an acceptance of the person who sinned. The emphasis is on the future. It's not on the past with our Lord. But be assured that there was no future for this woman if she decided to return to her past. That wasn't going to work. That's why he said, go and sin no more. Don't keep doing this. You've received forgiveness now. Move on. You have to be trapped by it. There's so much more for you. Jesus only offers forgiveness to those of us who are desiring to leave the past and move on to the joy of his future. Romans chapter 6, 1 and 2 says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Finally, it came down to just Jesus and the woman, face to face. The title of our series, A Spiritual Encounter of the Closest Kind. She had not received forgiveness from the Pharisees. Not, not a single one of them said, you know what, I'm so sorry we did this to you. I, I, I forgive my actions, or I ask that you might forgive me, I forgive you. That, that didn't happen. But she did receive the forgiveness of Christ. You know, of the two, it's always best to receive his forgiveness, even if no one else is willing to offer forgiveness. Okay? You and I can live with that. It might be uncomfortable at times. It might be a struggle. But if you have his forgiveness... That's all you need. It's nice to receive the forgiveness of others, but it's necessary for life to receive his. Fred Craddock was, um, he was teaching at Yale University. He was doing a bunch of lectures and he and his wife had been through a, a number of weeks that were just kind of stressful, and so he decided that he wanted to take a break, and um, he wanted to go back where he, he grew up, which was in the Gatlinburg, Tennessee area. So he and his wife decided to go down and have a long weekend and just get away and be alone. So one night, he decided that they ought to go out and have a nice meal, a little restaurant. He said, just let's just go somewhere. Nobody knows us, and we can just be the two of us, and it, it's no pressure, just... Let's just have a great night alone together. So they did. They went to this restaurant. But while they're there, uh, a gentleman enters the restaurant, very distinguished-looking, white-haired man, and he begins moving from table to table to table, and it's like he talks to everybody at every table, and Fred is just dying a thousand deaths, knowing, oh, my goodness, this man's going to come to our table. I just wanted to be alone. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to deal with anything. Just please, don't come here. Don't come here. Well... Their table was next, <laughs> and he did exactly that. He came to Fred's table. He said, uh, so, um, are you living in the area or just visiting? And, and he said, well, yeah, we're just, we're just here for a quiet weekend just to spend some time alone. And, and he said, well, what do you do for a living? He said, well, I teach homiletics, uh, graduate seminary at Phillips University. Oh, so he said, you tell preachers how to preach. Is that what you do? He said, yeah, in a way, I guess that's what I do. He said, I have a preacher story for you. At which inside, Fred is just dying a thousand deaths. He said, everybody's got a preacher story. Almost none of them are good. And I'm gonna have to sit and listen to this guy when I didn't really wanna talk to anybody tonight. So he sat down at the table 
put his hand across the table, shook hands with Fred, he said, hey, I'm Ben Hooper. I was born just across the mountains here in Tennessee. He said, my mom wasn't married at the time that I was born, so I had a really hard time growing up. When I, by the time I got to school, the whole town had a name for me. He said it wasn't very kind. The kids called me that all the time. He said, my mom and I used to have to go to town sometimes during um, the week, and every time we did, it was like every eye was on us, and when we would have time at school for lunch or a, a recess, I, I'd just go off by myself. I didn't want to be with anybody. So it was like everybody's eyes were always on me, always wondering, who is my dad? Who, who is it that really you know, brought you into this world? And he said, I just, I just hated it. He said, when I was about 12 years old, we got a new preacher at our church. Now, I, I had a habit because I really hated even going to church because I just felt like everybody's eyes were on me all the time. He said, so I would sneak in late, and then I would sneak out early. So nobody could really catch me, nobody could really talk to me. He said, but this one day, this new preacher had the shortest prayer I've ever heard. And he got to the back of the church before I did. And he said, everybody's starting to file out. And just the time I'm trying to pass him, I feel this hand, heavy hand on my shoulder and turns me around, and it's the preacher. And he said to me, who are you, son? Whose boy are you? And he said, I just died a thousand deaths. He said, I can't believe that somebody would ask me that question, let alone the preacher at church. And he said, but that preacher kept looking at me. He said, wait a minute. He said, I know who you are. He said, I see the family resemblance. You're a son of God. And with that, he said, he patted me on the rump and he said, you have a great inheritance. Go grab it. Ben Hooper said, you know, that was the single greatest sentence anyone ever said to me. With that, he got up. He said, thanks for giving me a minute. He moved on to the next table. After he left, it only took a moment or two when Fred Craddock remembered, having grown up in Tennessee, that Tennessee had two times elected as their governor a gentleman who was an illegitimately born child, Ben Hooper. Do a favor for me, close your eyes. Just close your eyes for a moment. Even you guys up doing the AV, God will take care of it. Jesus is saying to you, where are your accusers? Who is here who has a right to accuse you? Only me, Jesus and I offer you forgiveness. Do you know who you are? Do you not see the family resemblance? You're a child of God. You've got a great inheritance. Go grab it. Open your eyes for a moment. If you desire today, you can leave your life of sin behind and you can be cleansed. You can be freed from your past. And from this moment forward, you can go forth because you have a great inheritance before you. You have all of eternity before you. Don't lose that. Please, don't lose that. Let's pray. Today, Father, we, uh, we're looking at something that, that we all have struggled with. 
There's not a single solitary one of us here that hasn't had the need to be forgiven. And there are all of us have at one point or another in our life not felt like we should have it. Some of us have never felt like we should have it. And it's the most horrible struggle in the world. I pray today, Father, that we would learn something from this lady who, beyond a shadow of a doubt, did not think that she had a hope in the world that day. But she did. And his name was Jesus. And that's the same hope you and I have today. Help us not to pass that up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Moment that um, you have been caught red-handed in a sin. It's a kind of sin that is one of those heinous kinds of things that you know nobody really wants to forgive you of. It's just one of those horrible ones. And the unfortunate part is you are encircled by people who want to judge you, but that's not all. Your loved ones are there, your friends are there, your neighbors are there, your work associates are there. Everybody sees it. And you know that this is gonna be the most humiliating moment in your life. But then there's a man that stands up between you and all of them. And the words that he says disperses the crowd and he protects you and he embraces you. And he loves you. And he forgives you. You step back from him just a couple steps. And you look into his face. What do you want to say to him? That's what you're going to get to do in the next few moments as we go and meet around the Lord's table. You get to speak to that man face to face and you get to tell him what he deserves to hear from you don't waste this moment
Dear Lord, we uh, come before you this morning to just simply say thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son. We thank you for all that it stands for and all that it means, but especially for forgiveness. We thank you for the forgiveness that is offered to us, the forgiveness of our sins, the wrongdoing that we have done to you and to your son. Lord, but we can't repay that, but your son has paid that for us, Lord, and we thank you that uh, has been extended to us. And we pray, Lord, that as we go from this place, that we would extend that same forgiveness to others. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So good to be worshiping with you here today, whether you're watching online this morning or joined us in person today. It was good to see you. Uh, just, a, just a few things coming up, but if you are here for the first time, we'd love to meet you out at the Hub. Uh, just say hi. We have a gift for you. Uh, answer any questions uh, you may have about anything coming up. So uh, some, some announcements we got. We, we, we have been announcing that our back-to-school supply drive uh, is ending today, but we're going to extend it for another week. People have been asking, hey, I still haven't gotten to go out. Uh, and get everything. So there are still flyers out there in the lobby you can grab. You can bring stuff through the week. You can bring it next Sunday, and we'll get that all to the teachers at Lakemont Elementary School, uh, gift cards, tissue boxes, wh whatever it is. Uh, there's a good set of stuff sitting out there already, so we thank you for all of that, and they're going to be excited to be able to have those things. We got a couple uh, back-to-school events happening with our Encounter Kids. The first is a pool party on Saturday, August 19th at the Free House uh, from 11, uh, what's it say up there, to 2. Uh, we're going to have a pool party for all of our, our elementary students. And so just one of our, our kickoffs are back to school. And then on Friday the 25th, they are also going to be having a special worship night as, a, as another kind of kickoff to the school year. So this is for first grade through fifth grade. It's going to be Friday night, August 25th from 6 to 8.30, and it's going to involve a lot of different aspects. Uh, a number of our, our high school and middle school students will be putting this on for the Encounter Kids, uh, so we're excited about that as well. And then the last thing is we want to start promoting this month our Encounter Groups. Many of you I know are in Encounter Groups on different nights of the week, uh, but we are going to be officially launching our fall session of Encounter Groups uh, the week of September 3rd. Doesn't mean that if you're in a group now and you guys never took a break, don't, don't not show up this week. It just means we're having an official launch. So if you're not in a group, if you want to switch groups, if you want to find out about groups, I'll be back at the Hub. There's a sign-up list if you just want to put your name on there and a good contact information so we can get you plugged in. Uh, but the month of September is our official kickoff, and we're going to be doing an entire study all across all, most of our encounter groups together. So we're kind of all on the same page for six weeks as we launch into those things. So uh, if you have any questions, just see me out at the Hub. stand and sing as we close we're going to sing i have decided to follow jesus i have decided